I'm not really talking about human accountability, I'm talking about ethics, right? What is ethics? Ethics is the way that we keep our entire planet together, or not really our planet, it's our society. So ethics is something that is, uh, yeah, global at this point because of the interconnectivity we've created with ICT, right? So one of the things that we know from theoretical biology is when you increase the amount of communication, you get more group-oriented behavior. You start behaving more like a collective and less like individuals, right? This is something that's it's, it's science, right? More AI is going to mean more and faster coalitioning, right? This is some of the dynamics we're seeing. And this is science, right? It's something that's describing what we've seen in nature. This is theoretical biology, so it's not necessarily a fact, but it's one of the best theories out there. It was published in the journal Science, right, uh, by, by our colleagues. All right, so this is a different kind of thing. It's a set of uh, definitions. The reason I bring it up is that sometimes you hear people say, we can't make artificial intelligence because we don't even know what intelligence is. This is like a really broken thing to say, <laughs> okay? Look, there's lots of definitions of artificial, inte well, of intelligence, right? And I'm focusing on the second one because, uh, well, first of all, we've been using it for a century, more than a century. Secondly, it was the one I learned both as a psychology major and as an AI major, all right? All it's saying is that you're intelligent to the extent to which you do the right thing in the right context. Okay, that's how we judge it in animals, and so why don't we just use that as a definition for talking about AI, right? And I'm, I'm calling this policy because I want to make a point here. This isn't, this isn't science. We aren't going out and discovering a new species when we build AI, right? This is something where we've created a consensus over time so that when we communicate, we can know what we're talking about. And we're t in this case, we're talking about what is it that makes some animals uh, more able to choose a new action when they encounter a new situation, right? All right, so let's talk about some definitions more relevant to the problem of AI ethics and how we regulate AI. Intelligence, as I just mentioned, is doing the right thing at the right time, and artificial intelligence is an artifact, right? It's just intelligence and, but it's in something that we've built with intent, right? There's some reason we did that. Okay, an agent, what if it's an agent? Okay, now this depends on who you're talking about. If you read Davidson, agency is a big deal. But I'm gonna use, in the, in the context of this talk, agent is just a vector of change. So for example, you can have a chemical agent. That's not the thing that we really care about. Let me tell you what we really, really care about. We care about moral agency. We care about who it is that's responsible when something goes wrong. And that's defined by a society, all right? We do not have global consensus about when you're an adult, when you can consent to sex, when you can consent to marriage, when you can be in the army, right? That's something that a society determines. Similarly, there's another sort of reciprocal thing called moral patience. This is the stuff that a society has decided that the moral agents are responsible for. So for example, a little baby is not a moral agent, we don't blame the baby for what it does, but we do feel that we're all obliged to try to keep the baby alive. If you take these two things together, you have something called a moral subject. I'm gonna skip over that because we only have 17 minutes, all right? So ethics is a set of behaviors that creates a society. All right, now this is a very unusual definition of uh, ethics because people want to say things like, we're more ethical than those guys over there, right? We like to think that there's a single axis. But I'm claiming that since we know that moral agents and moral patients are defined by a society, so this is now a claim, it's not, a, it's not science or a consensus yet, um, that, that that implies that the same is true of ethics, all right? It doesn't mean that we can't say we're more, we're more ethical than we were, we just have to say in what terms. So for example, we're more ethical because fewer of our babies die, or we're more ethical because we more equally distribute goods, or something like that. Okay, so back to artificial intelligence. Already yesterday, somebody said we all know that if we're talking about AI, we're talking about accountability and transparency. What do these terms mean? Transparency means 
that you know what's going on, right? It's information that lets you know what the system is doing. This is what we want. Some people talk about trust in AI, but trust is something that people try to establish between each other because we can't really know things. It's a community thing. It's a public good uh, created between equals. We don't need that from an artifact. From an artifact, we can demand transparency. Why would we demand transparency? Because of accountability. So accountability is the responsibility that some society has assigned, right? There's this idea that you, ha you have an obligation, right? Generally speaking, a manufacturer of some kind of commercial product is accountable unless they can prove that they aren't, okay? This is about proof of due diligence. So if the bank loses all your money, if the bank can't figure out what happened to it, they have to come up with the money. If they can show that one of their employees stole it, then they might be able to say, okay, that person is liable. Or if they can show that a hacker stole it. But if they can't tell what happened, then they're the ones who are gonna come up with your money, right? So there's no reason in particular that AI should be different from this. It's just that we haven't gotten as good at enforcing the, the just ordinary laws across things like uh, the social media giants, all right? So transparency is actually something that corporations should want because if you do it right, if you just do simple things like DevOps, like proving that you've logged, that you did the right kinds of tests and that you know why people did what, then you're able to prove a lack of accountability, all right, or, or that you behaved in an accountable way, and so you can tell that, oh, maybe it was the user who used your, uh, your product incorrectly. It's not your fault for having created the product, right? So transparency is a tool. It's a tool that can help us do good within our societies. So these are actually two solutions. I want to talk quickly about two problems, all right? There's only actually two problems, sustainability and inequality. All right? And one way you could think about sustainability is, well, how, how do we grow the pie? And inequality is how do we share the pie we already have? All right? And so you can look through all of biology. This isn't just humans. They are trying to figure out how do we solve the problems. Now, interestingly, those of, you might have noticed this. We don't, when we're talking about uh, climate change, which I know a lot of people might be out talking about right now, um, we aren't usually talking about how do we grow the planet. Um, but that's something that has been taken out of discourse in the political economy, uh, well, for about 70 years. You guys know why. We're, we're standing in France. Um, but there, and it's true that there's quite a lot of ways that we can figure out how to keep increasing the number of humans on the planet. But it's also true that we're eradicating biodiversity. So we probably need to do both ways of fitting in within the pie and also ways of growing the pie, all right? Even chimpanzees behave differently if the pie starts to shrink. If there's not enough food, you have a troop, the troops will start splitting, and then they have chimpanzee warfare. And chimpanzees, um, Jane Goodall talks about, they de-chimpify each other. They start treating the other chimpanzees that used to be their friends and neighbors, they suddenly start treating them like they're a deer and ripping their limbs off. I mean, even, you know, I show this smiling uh, chimpanzees here, but even in, within a troop, you could actually have violence and murder and death sometimes, but the way you kill a, a troop mate is totally different from the way you, you would kill something you would eat. And once they've uh, gone into this contest where they've actually split up and started fighting over resources, they treat each other like animals, not like other chimpanzees. So even chimpanzees are doing that, even yeast are doing that. We've heard a lot about yeast here. Right? <laughs> These aren't actually yeast. These are amoebas. But normally they live their, their little normal you know, independent lives here. But if they get stressed, they form a collective and then they try something different. These are called slime molds. And they're able to come together and act as if they were one. Right? So these are strategies that we see all throughout nature. But humans are, of course, different. Right? We don't only have like the individual and then the family. We also have, well, neighbors, and, and physical neighbors matter. Um, but we also have coworkers, and we also have other kinds of organizations. It doesn't have to be a club, it can be a religion. You have lots of different identities that you can change between, right? And this is one of the amazing things about humanity, that we have this capacity of shifting who we think we are, and then, uh, well, but for good or for bad. Sometimes we call it polarization. 
So let's talk a little bit more about this. Okay, first of all, concepts like responsibility and intention, the other animals don't have those. They don't have words and labels, right? They may have some of the concepts. Again, you can see like Franz Duval talking about um, monkeys that don't feel that they've been uh, gotten their fair pay or whatever. But they don't have the, they can't argue and co-construct about whose responsibility, you know, what, what is accountability, right? Government enforcement are, are, are actually public goods. They're ways that we kind of keep our society together so that we can have more people fitting into the pie, right? They're, they're a mechanism for that. And I think it's really important. I, I couldn't believe on the first day, a few people, there's like three people who said they were working on policy, right? We should all be open, at least, to helping people figure out policy so that we can figure out how our products are affecting the rest of society and how society affects us. I mean, most regulation in AI is positive. It's upregulation. Most of the regulation is massive government spent because every country wants to be the leaders in AI. So it's insane for people to say, oh, don't regulate us. That stops us. You wouldn't be there if there hadn't been massive government investment, right? Regulation is helping you. But keeping things working uh, requires that we also help and we also pay, right? So we shouldn't be trying to duck our revenue obligations. I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of the uh, consequences of this. I think one of the fundamental things people forget is that you know, computation doesn't come for free. It's, it's a physical process. Transforming from perception into action takes time, space, and energy. And so when we use machine learning to build AI, we aren't like magicking intelligence out of nowhere. We're, we're mining the computation that our society has already done or that our species has already done, depending which thing we're using for the learning. And this explains the result we had in 2017 about why artificial intelligence would um, have the same prejudices, the same racism and sexism that humans have at the implicit level. Now, it's important to understand there's a difference between implicit bias and explicit bias. Implicit is stuff that you don't necessarily know you have, right? And that's why this was actually a somewhat controversial set of uh, studies because people were astounded. But just think about it. There's two different tasks. One is you have to hit a key when you see a woman's name and a family kind of word at the same time, or if you see a man's name and a career kind of word. So, how fast can you get the keys every time you've seen those pairs compared to if you had to do the other way around? Okay, so in a fair word, it would be a fair world, it would be just as fast to do um, women's names with career words and men's names with family words as the other way around. But that's not the world we live in. We find it easier to pair women's names with family words. So that's true of humans, and it's also true of AI. If you use word embeddings, they're not pushing the, the, now we're not talking about pushing buttons, we're talking about looking at how words are used in English, right? We, we just built, word embeddings are like giant spreadsheets that are just telling you like how often do words occur next to each other. And this goes back to the philosophy of what does a word mean, it's how it's used, right? And that's how search works. And that's how a lot of, not all of, uh, machine translation works. Anyway, those same word embeddings had the same prejudices in terms of how close together were the words as we have when we're pushing these buttons, all right? Why is that? Because it's just our own culture. We've used our culture and we've uploaded it into a machine, right? It's not something new, it's not coming from space. The other thing is that, that now that we have this in this other area, we were able to go out and check something. So I, I don't think my laser is gonna, yeah, it's not gonna show. So the Y axis, the vertical one, is the, those same sexist word embeddings that matched all the human stereotype behavior. The X axis is actual labor statistics showing what proportion of people with a particular job, the dots are jobs. So what proportion of people were women, okay? And you can see there's a 90% there's a correlation between the sexist word embeddings, right? So what is this telling us? It doesn't tell us that AI is sexist. What it tells us is that, that implicit biases come from our lived experience, right? 
So our implicit behavior is not our ideal. It's not the one we've chosen. It's something that's based out of our history, right? Whereas our explicit behavior, the stuff that we think that we're doing, that's because we're using language to plan and to create better realities, to choose futures that we want to be in. Does that make sense? So when we're talking about artificial intelligence, we have to understand enough about our own intelligence to see what we're doing to our own society, all right? And I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna to have to go very quickly on this. But polarization is correlated with inequality, and it has been for a very long time. And this, we, it, all of this stuff is not just caused by AI, it's probably caused by all kinds of technologies, right? But we know that we solved this before, and we solved it before through political action when enough bad things had happened, like World War I, <laughs> the, the financial crash of 29, and World War II. And then we kept inequality and, um, and uh, polarization relatively low, and we did this partly through redistribution, by having high wages so that the wages followed productivity. And then in 1978, we decided we didn't need to worry about that anymore. All right? So these kinds of things, right, are the ways that we are able to handle problems. It isn't necessarily AI, right? But we need to be able to come together and deal with those kinds of problems. So we talk about regulating artificial intelligence. As I mentioned, nothing is coming from nowhere. It's something we've built. Um, and I've already told you that. So I'm, I'm again, zooming through. Just so that you realize, you know, it isn't just the algorithms, it isn't just the data. These companies are huge, and they, they have their own fiber optic cables, for example, Google, for, for, the, uh, for, the, um, uh, for security, for cybersecurity, right? So when we're regulating AI, we don't want to reward corporations if we say that they've done some you know, magic thing like creating consciousness. We want to make sure that we uh, motivate them to do the right kinds of things, right? And the right kinds of things are making sure that the, the code is clear and safe, all right? Regulation should motivate clarity. And that just means, like I said, doing proper logging. I'm not saying that any artificial intelligence can be easily regulated or easily held accountable. I'm saying that if it isn't, then the companies who build it should get in trouble because we all can do good DevOps and explain why we did what we did. All right. So if we legislate and judicate for, for accountability, then transparency is gonna follow. All right, I'm, I, I, just very quickly, this is real-time uh, transparency uh, debugging tools that we've used to help humans understand ordinary people, not the only developers, understand what their robots are doing. Um, and if you want to work on this kind of stuff, you should come work with us at University of Bath. We just got a big new uh, doctoral training center. So we're looking for PhD students and people that have problems they want solved. So thank you very much.